The Cube presents KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2022. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Welcome to the Cube coverage of KubeCon 2022 EU. I'm here with my co-host, Paul Gillen. Pleased to work with you, Keith. Nice to work with you, Paul. And we have our first two guests. The Cube is hot, I'm telling you. We are having interviews before the start of even the show floor. I have with me, we got to start with the customers first. Uh, enterprise architect, Anand Khan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Cube time, Cube time first. Now you're first a Cube time. alumni. Yep. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, Hasib Habani, CEO Arathi, welcome back. Nice to uh, talk to you again today. So we're talking all things <coughs> Kubernetes, and we're super excited to talk to MoneyGram about their journey to Kubernetes. First question I have for Anand. Talk to us about what your pre-Kubernetes landscape looked like. Yeah, certainly, uh, Keith. So um, we had a, uh, you know, a traditional mix of legacy applications and modern applications. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we made the decision to move to a microservices architecture, um, and this was all happening while we were still on prem, right? So your traditional VMs, um, and you know, we started 20, 30 microservices, but with the microservices pack, you know, you quickly expand to hundreds of microservices. Um, and we started getting to that stage where managing them without sort of an orchestration platform uh, and just as traditional VMs was getting to be really challenging, right? Uh, especially from a, a day to operational, uh, you know, you can manage 10, 15 microservices, but when you start having 50 and so forth, um, all those concerns around, uh, you know, high availability, operational performance. Um, so we started looking at some open source projects, you know, Spring Cloud, uh, we are predominantly a Java, um, shop, so we looked at the Spring Cloud projects. Uh, they give you a number uh, you know, of initiatives um, for doing some of those um, management. And what we realized, again, to manage those components um, without sort of a platform was really challenging. So that, that kind of led us to sort of Kubernetes, where um, along with our journey to cloud, uh, it was the platform that could help us with a lot of those management operational concerns. So as you talk about some of those challenges, pre-Kubernetes, what were some of the operational issues that you folks experienced? Yeah, you know, uh, certain things like auto-scaling is, is number one, right? I mean, that's a fundamental concept of cloud native, right? Is um, how do you auto-scale VMs, right? Uh, you can put in some old methods and stuff, but uh, it was really hard to do that automatically, right? So uh, Kubernetes with like HPA gives you those out of the box, right? Provided you set the right policies, uh, you can have auto-scaling. Uh, where it can scale up and scale back. So we were doing that manually, right? So before, uh, you know, MoneyGram, obviously, you know, holiday season, people are sending more money, Mother's Day. Uh, our ops team would go and basically manually scale uh, VMs, right? So we'd go from four instances to maybe eight instances, right? Uh, but, but that entailed outages, right? Um, and just to plan around doing that manually and then sort of scale them back was a lot of overhead, a lot of administration overhead, right? So. Uh, we wanted something that could help us do that automatically, right, in, a, in an efficient, uh, unintrusive way, so. So, you know, that was one of the things, uh, monitoring um, and, and management uh, operations, you know, just kind of visibility into how those applications were during, what was the status of your um, workloads was also a challenge, right, uh, to do that. So, see, I got to ask the question, if someone would have came to me with that problem, I'd just say, you know what, go to the cloud. You yeah. know, the, what, what, how does uh, your group help solve some of these challenges? What do you guys do? Yeah, what, what do we do? So, here's my perspective on the market as it's playing out. So, I see a bifurcation happening in the Kubernetes space. So, there's the Kubernetes runtime. So, Amazon has EKS, Azure has AKS, you know, there's enough of these available. They're now managed services. They're actually really good, frankly. Right. In fact, we tell customers, if you're on Amazon, why would you spin up your own? Just use EKS, it's awesome. But then there's an operational layer that is needed to run Kubernetes. Uh, my perspective is that you know, 50,000 enterprises are adopting Kubernetes over the next five to 10 years, and they're all going to go through the same exact journey, and they're all going to end up you know, potentially making the same mistake, which is they're going to assume that Kubernetes is easy. 
<laughs> they're gonna say, well, this is not hard. I got this up and running on my laptop. This is so easy, no worries, right? I can do key gas. But then, okay, can you consistently spin up these things? Can you scale them consistently? Do you have the right blueprints in place? Do you have the right access management in place? Do you have the right policies in place? Can you deploy applications consistently? Do you have monitoring and visibility into those things? Do your developers have access when they need it? Do you have the right networking layer in place? Do you have the right chargebacks in place? Remember, you have multiple teams. And by the way, nobody has a single cluster, so you got to do this across multiple clusters, and some of them have multiple clouds. Not because they want to be multiple clouds, because, but sometimes you buy a company and they happen to be in Azure. How many dashboards do you have now? <laughs> across all the open source technologies that you have identified to solve these problems. This is where pain lies. So I think that Kubernetes is fundamentally a solved problem. Like our friends at AWS and Azure, they've solved this problem. It's like AKS, EKS, et cetera, GKE for that matter, they're, they're great and you should use them and don't even think about spinning up QB and EMBS clusters. Don't do it. Use the platforms that exist. And commensurately on premises, OpenShift is pretty awesome, right? If you like it, use it. But then when it comes to the operations layer, right, that's where today, we end up investing in a DevOps team and then an SRE organization that need to become experts in Kubernetes. And that is not tenable, right? Can you, let's say unlimited capital, unlimited budgets. Can you hire 20 people to do Kubernetes today? If you can find them. If you can find them, right? So even if you could, the <coughs> point is that, see, five years ago, when your competitors were not doing Kubernetes, it was a competitive advantage to go build a team to do Kubernetes so you could move faster. Today, you know, there's a high chance that your competitors are already buying from a Rafe or somebody like Rafe. So now, it's better to take these really, really sharp engineers and have them work on things that make the company money. Writing operations for Kubernetes, this is a commodity now. How confident are you that the cloud providers won't get in and do what you do and put you out of business? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, I mean, in fact, uh, I had a conversation with somebody from AWS this morning and I was telling them, I don't think you have a choice, you have to do this, right? Competition is not a bad thing, right? This, the, if we are the only company in a space, this is not a space, right? The bet we are making is that every enterprise has, you know, they, they have an on-prem strategy, they have at least a handful of, everybody's got at least two clouds that they're thinking about. Everybody starts with one cloud and then they have some other cloud that they're also thinking about. Um, for them to only rely on one cloud's tools to solve for on-prem plus that second cloud that potentially they may have, that's a tough thing to do. Um, and at the same time, V as a vendor, I mean the only real reason why startups survive is because you have technology that is di truly differentiated, right? Otherwise, right, I mean, you got to build something that is materially interesting, right? We Anon, seem to have, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to actually, you actually had me thinking about something. Anon, yes. MoneyGram, big, well-known company, a startup, adding, working in a space with Google, VMware, all the biggest names, what brought you to Rafi to solve this operational challenge? Yeah, good question. So when we started out sort of in our Kubernetes, um, you know, we had heard about EKS uh, and, and we are an AWS shop, so uh, that was the most natural path and, and we looked at um, EKS and, and used that to you know, create our clusters. Um, but then we realized <laughs> very quickly that yes, to Hasib's point, AWS manages the control plane for you, it gives you the high availability, so you're not managing those components, which is some really heavy lifting, right? Uh, but then what about all the other things, like you know, centralized dashboard, what about we need to provision uh, Kubernetes clusters on multi-cloud, right? We have other clouds that we use, uh, or also on-prem, right? Um, how do you do some of that stuff, right? Um, we, we also, at that time, were looking at uh, other uh, tools also, and I had, I remember, come up with an MVP list that we needed to have in place for day one, or day two uh, operations, right, to, before we even launch any single applications into production. Um, and my ops team looked at that list, um, and literally there was only one or two items that they could check, check off with EKS. You know, they, they've got the control plane, they've got the cluster provision, but what about all those other components? Uh, and so that kind of led us down the path of, uh, you know, looking at, hey, what's out there in this space? And, and we realized pretty quickly that there weren't too many. There were some large providers and capabilities like Anthos, but we felt that it was uh, a little too much for what we were trying to do, you know, at that point in time. We wanted to scale slowly, we wanted to minimize our footprint. Um, and, and Rafe seemed to sort of, uh, was, was a nice mix, uh, you know, uh, from all those different angles. How was, how was the situation affecting your developer experience? So, um, so that's a really good question also. 
So operations was one aspect of, to it, right? The other part is the application development, right? We've got, uh, you know, MoneyGram as when a lot of organizations have a plethora of technologies, right? From, from Java to .NET to Node.js, what have you, right? Um, now, as you start saying, okay, now we're going cloud native and we're going to start deploying to Kubernetes, um, there's a fair amount of overhead because the tech stack all of a sudden goes from, you know, just being Java or just being .NET to things like Docker, right? All these container orchestration and deployment concerns, Kubernetes, uh, deployment artifacts, right? I got to write all this YAML, uh, as my developers say, YAML hell, right? <laughs> uh, I got to learn Docker files. I need to figure out um, a package manager like Helm uh, on top of learning all the Kubernetes artifacts, right? So. Um, initially, we went with sort of, okay, you know, we can just train our developers, right? Um, and, and that was wrong, right? I mean, you can't assume that everyone is going to sort of learn all these deployment concerns uh, and we'll adopt them, right? Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's outside of their sort of core dev domain uh, that you're putting all this burden on them, right? So um, we could not rely on them and to be sort of kubectl experts, right? That There's a fair amount of overhead learning curve there. Um, so Rafi, again, from their dashboard perspective, right, sort of the managed cube cuddle, uh, gives you that easy access for devs, right, where they can go and monitor the status of their workloads. Um, they can, they don't have to figure out, you know, configuring all these tools locally just to get it to work. Uh, we did some things from a DevOps perspective to basically streamline and automate that process, but then also Rafi sort of came in and helped us out uh, on kind of that providing that dashboard. They don't have to worry, they can basically get on through single sign-on and have visibility into the status of their deployment. Uh, they can do troubleshooting, diagnostics, all through a single pane of glass, right, which was a key, key item. Uh, initially, before Rafi, we were doing that command line, right? And again, just getting some of the tools configured was uh, was huge, right? It took us days just to get that, and then the learning curve for development teams, right? Oh, now you got you got the tools. Now you got to figure out how to use it, right? So, um, Steve, talk to me about the the cloud native infrastructure. When I look at that entire landscape, and I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by it. As a customer, I look at it. I'm like, I, I don't know where to start. I'm sure. Or not, you, you, you folks looked at it and said, wow, there's so many solutions. How do you, how do you engage with the ecosystem? You have to be at some level opinionated, but flexible enough mm. to uh, meet every customer's needs. How, how do you approach that? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really tough problem to solve because, so, so the thing about abstraction layers you know, we, we all know how that plays out, right? So abstraction layers are fundamentally never the right answer because right. they will never catch up, right? Because mm -hmm. you're trying to write a layer on top. So then we had to solve the problem, which was, well, we can't be an abstraction layer, but then at the same time, we need to provide some sort of sort of like centralization, standardization, right? So, so we sort of have this, the following dissonance in our platform, which is actually really important to solve the problem. So we think of a, of a stack as sort of four things. There's the, there's the Kubernetes layer, infrastructure layer, um, and EKS is different from EKS, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. If we try to now bring them all together and make them behave as one, our customers are going to suffer because there are features in EKS that I really want, but then if you write an abstraction layer, I'm not going to get them, so not okay. So treat them as individual things and people logic that we now curate. So every time EKS, for example, goes from 1.22 to 1.23, we write a new product just so my customer can press a button and upgrade these clusters. Similarly, we do this for AKS, we do this for GK. It's a really, really hard job, but that's the job, we got to do it. On top of that, you have these things called add-ons, like my network policy, my access management policy, my et cetera, right? These things are all actually the same. So whether I'm in EKS or AKS, I want the same access for Keith versus Adnan, right? So then, those components are sort of the same across, doesn't matter how, how many clusters, doesn't matter how many clouds. On top of that, you have applications. And when it comes to the developer, in fact, I do the following demo a lot of times, because people ask the question, right, I mean, I, I, people say things like, I want to run the same Kubernetes distribution everywhere because this is like Linux. Actually, it's not. So I, I do a demo where I spin up a, access to an OpenShift cluster, and an EKS cluster, and an AKS cluster, and I say, log in, show me which one is which. They're all the same. So oh, Anand, uh, yeah. make that real for me. I'm sure after this amount of time, developers, groups have come to you with things that are snowflakes. And, you, and as an enterprise architect, you have to make it work within your framework. 
How has working with Rafi made that possible? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think one of the very common concerns is, right, the whole deployment, right, uh, to Haseeb's point, right, is you're, from, an, from a deployment perspective, uh, it's still using Helm, it's still using some of the same tooling, um, right, but um, how do you, Rafi gives us uh, some tools, you know, they have a, a command line R cuddle API that essentially we use. Um, we wanted parity um, across all our different environments, different clusters, you know, it doesn't matter where you're running. Um, so that gives us basically a consistent API for deployment. Um, we've also had um, challenges uh, with just some of the tooling in general that we worked with Rafay actually to actually extend their R Cuddle API for us so that we have a better deployment experience for our developers. So, uh, Haseeb, how long does this opportunity exist for you? At some point, do the cloud providers figure this out or does the open source community figure out how to do what you've done mm. and, and this opportunity is gone? So, so I think back to a platform that I, I think very highly of, which has been around a long time and continues to live, vCenter. I think vCenter is awesome. I think it's, it's, it's beautiful, VMware did an incredible job. Uh, what is its job? Its job is to manage VMs, right? But then it's also access, it's also storage, it's also networking and sex, right? All these things got done because to solve a real problem, you have to think about all the things that come together to solve, help you solve that problem from an operations perspective, right? My view is that this market needs essentially a vCenter, but for Kubernetes, right? Um, and that is a very broad problem. Right? and it's going to span, it's not about a cloud, right? I mean, every cloud should build this. I mean, why would they not? It's, it makes sense, Anthos exists, right? Everybody should have one. But then, you know, the clarity in thinking that the Rafi team seems to have exhibited till date seems to merit an independent company, in my opinion. I think, like, I mean, from a technical perspective, this product is awesome, right? I mean, you know, we seem to have you know no real competition when it comes to this broad breadth of capabilities. Will it last? We'll see, right? I mean, I keep doing cube shows, right? So every year you can ask me that question again. <laughs> well, you're, and we'll see. You make a good point, though. I mean, you're up against VMware. You're up against yeah. Google. They're both trying to do sort of the same thing you're yeah. doing. What's? Why are you succeeding? Maybe it's focus. Maybe it's because of the right experience. I think startups. Only in hindsight can one tell why a startup was successful, in all, all honesty. I've, I've, I've been in, in a, a one or two startups in the past, um, and there's a lot of luck to this, there's a lot of timing to this. I think this timing for a product like this is perfect. Like three, four years ago, nobody would have cared. Like, honestly, man, nobody would have cared. This is the right time to have a product like this in the market because so many enterprises are now thinking of modernization, and because everybody's doing this, this is like the bootstorm problem in HCI. Everybody's doing it, but there's only so many people in the industry who actually understand this problem, so they can't even hire the people. And the CTO said, I got to go, I don't have the people, I can't fill the, the seats. And then they look for solutions. And we are that solution that we're going to get embedded. And when you have infrastructure software like this embedded in your solution, we're going to be around, with the, assuming obviously we don't screw up, right? We're going to be around with these companies for some time. We're going to have strong partners for the long term. Well, vCenter for Kubernetes, I love to end on that note. Intriguing conversation, we could go on forever on this topic, because there's a lot, of, a lot of work to do. I think, uh, I don't think this will ever be a solved problem for the Kubernetes or cloud native solution, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Haseeb, Haseeb Haban, thank you for rejoining theCUBE, Adnan Khan. Welcome becoming a CUBE alum. <laughs> awesome, you thank you so much. get your own so profile much. on the, on the <laughs> CUBE's website, it's right. really cool. From Valencia, Spain, I'm Keith Townsend, along with my host, Paul Gillen, and you're watching theCUBE, the leader in high-tech coverage.